What's up everybody, this is Cakes and welcome back to another tutorial in which we create shader hot code reloading and we do texture hot reloading. We start off with the GL renderer and we're going to add in two fields into the GL context. We need to store the timestamp of the current texture and the shader timestamp. And the reason why this is one timestamp is because if either of the two shaders change, then we need to reload both of them. And I will always store the latest timestamp of both of these files so that we have a comparison that we have to look out for. Okay, so the hot texture reloading is actually quite simple and is almost just one simple section in the GL render loop. The only thing we have to do is get the timestamp of our current texture. We compare that with the texture timestamp that we got before. And if that is greater, then obviously the texture changed. Then we need to make sure that we index into slot zero. That is the current active texture that is very important uh, this corresponds to this binding location zero that is an index that is very important that we index into the correct location here and then we just reload the file using stbi load and then we set the data to the texture and then of course after that we free the image and we assign the current timestamp so you might have noticed that this get timestamp is getting angry at us and the reason for that is because it expects a const char or it doesn't expect a const char so basically the get timestamp function we have to supply a const character here and then the error will go away and this is already everything we need to do to hot reload textures we just have to make sure that we get the timestamp when we create the texture so right here when we generate our texture using stbi we can copy the current timestamp of the texture into the gl context now we have something to compare against whenever the game is running so if we now run the program and build a bunch of tiles and then we switch over to a sprite and you know, just draw on top of them and then export that. We should see the change in game. Obviously, we don't want that, but I just wanted to show that it works. In order to do hot shader reloading, we actually have to create somewhat of a helper function to create shaders. So above the GL init function, we post the GL create shader function. And I'm going to quickly go over how this works, but that should be familiar for you because we have already done this before. We take in an in shader type, a shader path and a bumper locators because we need to load in a file. And then we try to load in the file using the transient storage. If we are unable to do so, we toss an error and return zero. Zero is basically the open gel handle for it didn't work out. If that works though, then we can create the shader and get ourselves an ID. And then we set the shader source and compile the shader. And then we basically do the error testing that we did before. You know, we do the success, the shader log, we do the shader IV, and then we get the shader log. And also we return zero here if that doesn't work out. But if everything works out, we return the shader ID. And so that means we also have to change this part of our program. Basically, I want to delete all of this right here up until the portion where we create the program like this now obviously we don't have a vertex shader and a fragment shader and we're going to replace this with calls to the gl shader function gl create shader function the first one is the vertex shader you know loading in the vertex shader and the second one is the fragment shader loading in the fragment shader we also do error checking here if we are unable to create them or load them then we return false if we are able to do so though then we are storing both of their timestamps and we use the maximum of the two as the shader timestamp and now we also have to include or implement this max function in order to do that we have to go into the schnitzel library right here we are going to add the function into the math section so go down to that and then we paste it right here i don't think i have to explain this very much but basically we have a and b and then if a is greater we return a otherwise we return b back in the renderer we should now have no more errors and building and running should still work the same now it's time to actually check for shader hot reloading and in order to do that i want to create a section in the gl render function just like the hot texture reloading section i want to create another one right below there okay i just paste it in the shader hot reloading and you notice that we need the transient storage so i want to quickly get that out of the way first basically add the transient storage here then save the file and we switch over to the main and then down below where the gl render function is being called in the main loop we supply the address to the transient storage once that is fine, we switch back to the GL renderer and then we can look at shader hot reloading. But it's basically the same thing. We get the timestamp of both of these files and then whether one of these timestamps is greater, then we want to create them again. So we load them in again, make sure that we actually got them back. If not, we return. So we don't want to replace the already working existing shaders. But if they both
both work, then we attach them to the program and link them. Since we are only using one program, we don't have to delete it. I tested it out and it seems to work very nice. And then we also do the detach and delete shader afterwards and we store the timestamp. Now, if we run the program again, we can, you know, build ourselves something cool here and then move this cube. If we now switch over to the fragment shader, for example, and then we add in color, let's say red, and we save the shaders, you can see that it is red. And it's easier or better if I do this side by side. Let's, for example, change this red to a green, right? We could also change it to blue. I like blue the most. Blue looks the best. Yeah, and now you can, if you want to, change the shaders while running and maybe think about how you could supply color to the shaders or something, right? And this is everything for this tutorial. A lot of cool changes, but not much else. I hope you enjoyed the tutorial. If you did, please leave a like and subscribe like always. And I'll see you in the next one in which we create actually Celeste. We add that to the game and then we add in collision detection and movement. Until then, have a good one. Peace.